chapter 13. This is the assessment of the trauma patient. So up to this point, we've been learning about the basics of assessment and the assessment that really applies to all of the patients that we come into contact with. Obviously, even in those cases, there is some modification depending on the patient's condition. Say, for example, a cardiac arrest patient who has no pulse, therefore has no blood pressure, it is uh, uh, senseless to, uh, to take that. Uh, however, when we start looking at things like the trauma patient versus the medical patient, we start to modify our techniques in order to meet the, the needs of the various patient types. So obviously we have a few objectives here to cover in this chapter. We have a multimedia video that shows you um, a little bit about multi-system uh, trauma patients. And you can get to that from your non-recorded uh, lecture or PowerPoint. Core concept to look at the difference between the assessment procedures for a trauma patient with no significant mechanism of injury and for the patient with significant mechanism or injury. Um, and, and you might ask, well, what's the difference here? Well, significant mechanism of injury means somebody who probably has a, a true um, traumatic emergency. When we would think of a, a true traumatic emergency, we think of you know lots of blood and guts and distracting injuries versus the patient who maybe has a minor isolated traumatic injury. So we get called, say, you know, a, a car crash where somebody is ejected um, and has you know, multiple uh, severe injuries and is unresponsive, obviously has the significant mechanism of injury, versus we might get called to the baseball field for someone who slid into base, their ankle caught, and you know, has an isolated injury to, to their lower leg. Um, so that's the difference that we're looking at here. We're also going to look at how to conduct the history uh, of the present illness for the trauma patient. We put less emphasis on history and more emphasis on physical exam for the trauma patient. And that's a, the third point there is how to perform the physical exam for the trauma patient. How to obtain a past medical history for the trauma patient. Perform a rapid trauma assessment particularly for those patients that are, that are uh, unstable, when and how to perform a detailed physical exam for a trauma patient. Sometimes we don't get all the way to what we would quote unquote call the end of the assessment. So we'll start with the secondary assessment of the trauma patient. Okay, so remember we have talked about the primary assessment. The purpose of the primary assessment was to find and treat life threats. And when we get to the secondary assessment, we're looking now to uh, get a minor history, a small history on our patients, and then uh, dive into the physical examination. This is a difficult thing for a lot of EMT students, EMTs and paramedics that are licensed even, to do. Uh, the physical examination requires you to get up close and personal with your patients. Uh, if you don't think you can stand putting your hands on somebody, this might be a good time to reconsider your, your career path here. Um, if you can't put your fingers on somebody else, you're going to have a very difficult time doing a, a um, physical examination. So a patient with no significant MOI or mechanism of injury, this assessment is focused on the areas of the patient that they note are painful or that there is no, uh, or that the mechanism of injury indicates. So. If we have you know, that patient that slid into to base, maybe you have a, a person who got, um, who, who fell um, but yet fell on outstretched arms and is only complaining of wrist or arm pain. Um, somebody who's gotten a, a laceration, uh, just very isolated, actually, to be honest, minor things that probably in many cases really don't need EMS but many times we get called anyway. So since we're there, a lot of times we do the assessment. And, and, in, and in cases, at least this, at this current time, uh, transport these people into the emergency room. This may not always be the case in EMS. Uh, the way that healthcare is evolving, 
we may see a lot more uh, what I refer to as treat and release, where we get called to a patient. Uh, we get there, we show up, and the patient has a minor minor incident, um, doesn't require picking up an, an ER bed, maybe somebody we can route to an urgent care center, and uh, they can have you know get their stitches or their quick X-ray, um, you know, and be on their way. In, in the grand scheme of things, when you look at costs and whatnot, the a trip to the doctor's office is the least expensive. A trip to the emergency room is the most expensive. And somewhere in between there is a trip to, say, an urgent care. So a, a minor medical, uh, uh, you know, a, a urgent stop or there's various different things or, you know, you're starting to see them show up in grocery stores and whatnot now. Um, but uh, that kind of falls somewhere in the middle between our standard doctor's office charge and an ER charge. You're not getting out of the ER probably for less than a thousand bucks, and that's, uh, uh, that's that's not cost effective. And, and even more so, not being cost effective, you're taking up a bed that somebody who truly is uh, having an emergency may need. So we're basically going to look at the patient's chief complaint. Uh, obviously that's why we're called. Now that may not be the same thing in which we got on the dispatch information, so be careful not to be lit led by that inf dispatch information. You need to discuss this and talk with your patient. We look at the history of the present illness and the information of how this injury occurred. So we let them tell us in their own words uh, what happened. Did you, you know, and then we'll clarify it. Did you lose consciousness? Did you hear a pop or feel a snap? Um, you know, can you explain how the, the injury has proceeded since? And that's really the way that, that we derive our assessment on these, these patients. Um, is we, we ask clarifying questions. We look specifically at this uh, information we're given. That's not to say we don't ask other clar clarifying questions, okay? So you say you fell. Do you have, you know, and they're complaining maybe, say, uh, of... Uh, you know, arm pain. They fell on that outstretched arm and they're complaining of arm pain. That doesn't mean we don't ask them, did you, do you complain of, or do you have any um, uh, complaints of head, neck, or back injuries? Well, no, I don't. Well, that, that's good. That's, a, that's called getting a pertinent negative. Is that The patient didn't volunteer it for us, but it was something that we would expect in some patients who had fallen they would have head, neck, or back pain. So we gather that information. That helps us rule things out and helps cover our butts. Um, sometimes uh, we show up and you ask that, that question, and they're like, you know, now that you mention it, yes, I do. Well, that kind of changes the whole perspective and changes the whole paradigm that we're, we're going to treat this patient on. So elements of our history of our present illness, the nature of the force involved. Okay, we're talking trauma patients. Trauma only occurs from... Uh, f from energy or force, and uh, this could be things like burns, falls, uh, shootings, stabbings, uh, car crashes, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, the, na the direction and the strength of the force. Okay, well, I fell uh, a fall. We go on a lot of falls in EMS. Uh, it's one of my most despised calls because most falls are really kind of lame. But... Um, responding to a fall, the complaint of a fall is wide open for interpretation. Um, I have seen people fall three, four, five, six stories, and then you see people who fall, or they call it a fall, where they really just slid out of their chair. Um, so they didn't even fall from standing, they fell from sitting. So there's a very big difference in the forces that are involved here any protective equipment that that patient used. So um, say we go to a, a sporting event. Uh, did you have on your helmet? Was it strapped on correctly? Were your pads on? Or do you wear pads? It depends on obviously the type of, of activity they're involved in. If you're going to a, a vehicle crash, were you seat belted? And was it a lap belt or was it a lap and shoulder belt? Uh, was it um, actually really on you or was it were you sitting on it? Um, sometimes we have to, to clarify this with the patient. It's, we don't care whether or not you truly did or truly didn't have your seatbelt on, but in order to treat you most appropriately, 
we need to know the truth. We're not the ones that are going to be concerned with the tickets and whatnot. But in order to treat you appropriately, we need to know whether it was or, or it wasn't. So, um, so I said airbags deployed, um, car seats, but the, was the pediatric patient in a car seat or some sort of a booster seat or uh, um, whatnot. What actions were taken to prevent or minimize any injury? So you said you, you fell. Did you put your arms out to catch yourself? Um, was there anything that helped you break your fall on the way down? Did you fall into a bush? Did you fall under the cement? Um, did you fall down the stairs? You said you fell down the stairs. How far up the stairs were you to begin with? Were you all the way at the top of the stairs or did you fall down two stairs? Um, that could be a, a huge difference. So areas of pain and injuries resulting from the incident. Because sometimes we might get called to that fall and uh, they're telling, you ask them, what, you know, what's going on? What's, what's hurting you? Well, my back hurts. Oh, okay. Um, tell me a little bit more about your back pain. Well, it started six months ago. Um, so is it any different now after the fall? Well, no. Uh, then that probably doesn't have much to do exactly with what we're dealing with here. Uh, so that's that clarifying, going in there and asking more and more. Um, okay, so you complain of uh, your leg hurting. Can you describe the amount of pain that you're, you're in? Um, and we'll talk about a mnemonic that we use for that here in a little bit. Has it gotten worse? Has it stayed the same? And so on and so forth. So our physical exam, <laughs> these area, uh, areas are assessed depend on those injuries or chief complaint mechanism of injury may point to potential injuries and we have three major techniques we use in physical examination inspection palpation and auscultation um, I will tell you that in most cases we use inspection and palpation a lot and we use auscultation very minimally at the ENT level really the only thing that you are listening for is breath sounds or lung sounds and then that can also be considered audible sounds which are things that you hear without your stethoscope. So you walk in, you hear that croupy cough. So auscultation at the advanced levels gets used a little bit more. So inspection. Look for abnormalities in symmetry. So basically what, we, what we're saying here is if one side is hurt and the other side is not, let's look at them both together. Obviously you're going to concentrate mostly on the side that's hurt, but we're talking about, well, uh, you know, I, I fell down on my outstretched arm and now it has this weird bend to it. Well, let's look at that weird bend and how does it look compared to the other side. Now, that's not always a perfect way to assess your patient, but if that patient has never had any sort of trauma or injury or deformity uh, to the, uh, the unaffected side, it's a good representation of what you should expect to see on the other side. Um, color, what's the color of the extremity? Is it the same color? Did you get an artery pinched uh, when you dislocated your shoulder? Somebody dislocates a shoulder, the artery pinches in there, and it cuts off the significant blood supply going down into that arm. It could become very pale, could become uh, cyanotic or uh, mottled even. So, Shape, uh, is it the right shape? Does it bend where it's supposed to bend? Uh, does it... Uh, have a weird curve in it. I remember my first call in EMS many, many moons ago that uh, a lady had uh, stepped off of a, uh, a step wrong, fell on an outstretched arm, and had what we refer to as a silver fork fracture, or basically right in the middle of her forearm, where it should be nice and straight, there was a nice outward bowing curve to it um, because she'd broken both her radius and her ulna. Uh, and then movement. Can they move it? Have they tried to move it? What happens when they try to move it? Does it hurt more? Does it uh, does it function fully? Is it restricted? Are there limitations? So on and so forth. Um, now, when we say inspection, oftentimes that means we need to actually see the, the physical part. So if we're talking uh, going out in the middle of January in a snowstorm, somebody's complaining of arm pain, um, we're going to need to see them. We're going to need to, to cut sleeves or get their arms out of their sleeves or whatever to look at them. 
Um, so sometimes we have to say, hey, we got to make them naked. Uh, and by making them naked, we are uh, uh, going to look at the, the afflicted parts. That doesn't mean we leave them naked, but it means that we may need to examine it and then uh, re restore their modesty and restore their privacy by covering them back up. So on palpation, palpation is feeling. Uh, we're going to feel for any abnormalities in the shape. So as we know, uh, as we're, we're practicing in class, we're going to do some palpation where we're running our hands and fingers uh, on over different patients' body parts. Um, and I encourage you to do this as much as possible um, uh, on healthy people so you know what it should actually feel like. So when you get out there and there's something that feels out of the norm, you can pick up on that. We're going to feel the temperature of their skin. So how does that skin feel? Is it warm on one side but cold on the other? That, that can be leading as well. Uh, you may have to uh, consider all the options. Is you know, Has this arm been covered and that other arm not been covered? Uh, and they've been outside. Uh, the texture. Uh, texture may or may not have much to do with your, your palpation, but sometimes people have oddball uh, things occur to them, maybe have some air trapped within their, their tissues, um, and it feels very odd. Uh, and then sensation. Can you tell me how your hands feel? Now this is kind of, kind of odd when we say sensation. This is really we're touching them but asking them what they feel. So do you feel me touching your hand? Do you feel me touching your hand? Uh, one thing I'll give you kind of on that, if you have a patient and you're trying to assess whether they have good nervous tissue or good ner nervous, uh, um, if their nervous system is intact uh, and you are touching the bottoms of their feet, don't let them see what foot you're touching. Um, have them look straight up at the ceiling or close their eyes and tell me what foot am I touching? What foot am I touching? Uh, that's the better way to actually get um, the patient's true assessment. Whereas if somebody is, is nervous and, you know, oh, I don't, I don't think anything's wrong. I don't think anything's wrong. So I'm just going to tell them, oh, yeah, I can see he's touching my left foot. So I tell him left. So what I'll do oftentimes is I'll actually do three touches. I'll touch one foot. I'll touch another foot or the other foot, and then I'll touch neither foot and ask them, which foot am I touching, which foot am I touching, which foot am I touching? Um, and if you're touching neither foot, um, obviously they should be able to tell you, oh, I, I don't feel you touching me. Auscultation. So this is listening for decreased, absent, or abnormal breath sound. Uh, this is something also that will be practiced in class, listening to good, healthy lung sounds. Um, and in most cases, that's it's fairly um, normal, average turbulence, we'll call it, uh, of air flowing in and out of the lungs. It's when we start to add mucus and, and fluids in there that we start to hear bubbles and crackles and snaps and whatnot that changes things up a little bit. Also, if we hear nothing in there, that can be a, bit, a bad sign. Or if we listen to one side and it's really good and clear, but we listen to the other side and we can barely hear anything moving. So it might be diminished or decreased in there. Not always are absent lung sounds a, a bad sign. Occasionally, people have lungs removed. All right, so another good EMS acronym here. When we're doing our physical exam, this is what we're looking at for all of the body parts. Now, each body part may have some separate little things that we additionally look for, um, such as uh, if we're going to assess arms, we're probably going to be looking for um, sensation, motor, and uh, uh, circulatory function in the extremities. But generally speaking, we're looking for these things that, that are composing the DCAP BTLS, or some people call this DCAP Biddles. Um, but the DCAP Biddles, this stands for deformities, or things that are out of shape, out of the normal shape. Contusions, which is bruises. Uh, that's a medical term for a bruise, which may or may not actually have a red or purpley look to it. Um, abrasions, this is a scrape. 
most of us have suffered this many times when we were kids learning to um, say ride our bicycles we ended up with lots of abrasions on our on our knees and our our elbows punctures and penetrations uh, a puncture wound versus a penetration um, a, a puncture is usually something that goes in and uh, uh, comes back out penetration can be something that went in one area and came out another area or maybe it, it could could still be a lot of times we get classified together and sometimes we have what's called impaled objects and in, impaled objects is when the, the item goes in and it stays in so let's say you get stabbed in abdomen uh, and they let go of the knife and the knife handle sticking out of the abdomen that's a impaled object burns pretty self-explanatory tenderness Tenderness is different from pain uh, by the fact that pain is generally fairly constant, whereas tenderness, you have to invoke it by doing something. Usually that means when the caregiver touches you. So and, you, know, you might say, oh, my ankle doesn't hurt unless I move it or unless you touch it. Then it's tender. Uh, lacerations. Laceration is a broad scope term for cuts and then swelling. That's pretty self-explanatory as well. So example of deformity there. That's similar to that silver fork fracture I was telling you about. Puncture and penetration. Really doesn't look like much, but really the the bad the bad sign, uh, the bad thing behind that is the uh, occasions in which thing debris is trapped in there and it's festers into some sort of a uh, infection. Also, you don't know how far, how deep it went. Swelling, uh, swelling obviously is uh, the tissue is, is starting to uh, expand a bit. All right, so secondary assessment, no significant mechanism of injury. So we get a baseline set of vital signs, and obtain a past medical history. So baseline set of vital signs, if we hadn't gathered a the full set of vital signs, um, we should have done that uh, you know, at some point during our, our assessment year and getting that full set. And then obtain the past medical history, which we're going to get to here in a second. So when we're talking vital signs and assessment, we need to, to clarify a couple of terms here. Signs and symptoms. Uh, signs are objective, symptoms are subjective. Objective means you can see the object, basically you can detect that object. Sub subjective or symptoms means uh, something the patient has to relay on to you. Um, so I like to think of it this way, when I have to determine signs versus symptoms. Signs, I can see a stop sign, so that's something that I can see without somebody else pointing that out. So a sign would be, oops, sign would be something like um, bleeding, vomit, sweaty skin, um, obviously vital sign, uh, things that you can hear or or uh, feel. Say crepitus. Crepitus is a grating of bones. Um, symptoms, on the other hand, these are things a patient has to tell you about. You cannot see pain. You might see a grimace on their face, um, but you can't see pain. They have to tell you what their pain is like. They have to tell you that they're dizzy or they're nauseated. Um, so those that's the difference. Uh, symptoms are things you get from the patient. Signs are things you can directly observe. So when we talk past medical history, we talk another uh, acronym here, and that is SAMPLE. Um, SAMPLE stands for Signs and Symptoms, Allergies, Medications, Pertinent Past History, Last Oral Intake, and Events Leading Up. So to uh, dive into those a little deeper then, signs or symptoms, just what we talked about, allergies. This is allergies to a variety of different things environmental allergies, medication allergies, food allergies, uh, those are the big ones. Uh, medications, when we say medications we're meaning things like things you're taking because your doctor gave you a prescription, things that you're taking because the doctor told you get this over the counter and take it, herbs and other supplements that they may have opted to take on their own, 
or maybe even under medical advice, and then also recreational medication um, or uh, drugs, obviously. Pertinent past history, with that we're inquiring on what exactly uh, have you had for medical problems, surgeries, injuries, so on and so forth in the past. We throw that term pertinent up there in the front because when we are looking at histories, we can get people that will just drone on and on and on about their medical problems that they have had in the past. And in those cases, uh, it really delays uh, the uh, getting to the meat and potatoes of what we're looking for. Last oral intake. Um, this is, is one of the, the least used pieces of information here. However, when it is used, it's fairly important. It's very important to any patient going to surgery that we know what the last oral intake was. Um, so if it's something we can pass on. However, there are a few things such as allergic reactions and diabetic reactions. Um, that can tell us a lot. When was the last time and what did you have orally? and then any event leading up to that injury or illness. Describe what was going on when this all happened. Um, you know, I was, uh, I was cleaning uh, leaves out of my gutters and uh, uh, I lost my balance and fell off the roof. Um, I uh, uh, had gotten up this morning, taken my insulin, decided I was going to jump in the shower quick before I ate breakfast and next thing I know I'm wet, naked and you guys are standing over the top of me. Um, so that's kind of some of the description. Um, you may have to to, to actually look back further uh, and and talk a little more about well, how have you been feeling lately? Well, I've been sick and flu, you know, had flu-like symptoms for the last week or so. So those are some other uh, examples. Uh, real briefly, the application of a cervical collar. Um, if the patient has a, a mechanism of injury that is suggestive, that this that we need to take precautions to immobilize the patient's spine. Uh, or they complain of head, neck, or back pain, uh, we need to apply a cervical collar. Uh, there is a, uh, a little scan uh, in, your, in your textbook on pages uh, 324 and 325, and it actually even starts on 323 a little bit. Um, it talks about applying the cervical collar. So you need to make sure that the cervical collar is sized appropriately. There are different versions. You need to know your equipment. Uh, in most cases in class, we will be using an adjustable C collar. But the way that it, this is done is one person holds the head still, basically give the patient earmuffs, or you can move your head, hands just down to the south so they can still hear what's going on. Um, and then the person who's going to actually apply the collar takes their hand, lies it, and puts it flat up against the patient's neck and then rests their bottom of their hand, their pinky finger side of the hand, as far down on the patient's shoulder and still remain um, flat uh, against the, the neck and upright. You then measure up how many fingers does it take to get to the angle of the jaw, which is uh, the, the crook of the jaw where it goes from coming downward from the ear to jutting outwards to the chin. Um, and that is the same number of fingers that it needs to, to be measured for the C collar coming from the bottom of the C collar up to either the sizing pin or the uh, hole or the, the place in which you will uh, insert the tab to uh, lock the adjustable collar. So you're going to assess that patient's neck prior to placing that collar. So you're going to obviously need to size the collar, but assess the patient's neck prior to placing the collar. Once you put the collar on, even though there's a hole in the middle of it, you're not going to be able to check their, for things like jugular venous distension, which are the veins on the side of the neck bulging out, nor are you going to be able to really assess any of the DCAT BTLS of the neck or whether the trachea is in the middle of the neck. So you need to check those things prior to putting the collar on. Uh, reassure the patient. The patient's going to be a little nervous You're putting something around their neck. Most people don't like things tight around their neck. And then remove any jewelry or move the hair that they may have um, around their neck. Um, 
the hair I think is, is a no-brainer, but a lot of times we don't think about the necklace, uh, if that patient's wearing a necklace. Um, and that really can actually cause a lot of problems. What do x-rays uh, really, really show? X-rays really show metal. So if they have this metal necklace on uh, and it's running around their neck and it's hidden underneath the C-collar, you don't get a good, accurate, uh, clean picture when there's metal right there in the middle. So if you can take that uh, necklace off, hand it to the patient, hand it to a family member, um, just keep track of where it went, um, and then make sure that the patient uh, is aware of where it went as well. <clears throat> so you're going to slide the collar up from the front um, until the chin rests nicely in the, uh, the chin area of the C-collar there. And then once uh, you've slid that up and it comes into contact with the chin, you'll pull the back side of the collar around and Velcro it into place. Now, this is probably one of the most important uh, slides here, is the collar alone does not provide adequate in-line immobilization. It must be paired with manual stabilization and or a long spine board and head immobilization device. Um, before it can be considered a complete immobilization. So simply throwing a C-collar on somebody is not good enough. In fact, it's a good way to get yourself sued. If you said, well, we recognized that the patient probably had a head, neck, or back injury, and we threw a collar on them, but you didn't do the full job, they're going to nail you for negligence. All right. So when we shift to the secondary assessment significant mechanism of injury, we're going to continue our manual stabilization. Uh, we're going to request ALS and complete our rapid head-to-toe trauma assessment. Um, and when we do this rapid head-to-toe, we're really going to do a, a good once-over, including the back, um, and then base the remainder of our assessment and treatment off of what we find from there. So this only requires a few moments to do, should be performed on scene. Uh, care provided in route will be based off of this assessment. So we're going to quickly take a look at the head, the neck, the chest, the abdomen, the pelvis, the back, the extremities, the genitals occasionally when the situation warrants it, and of course get our baseline vital signs. Um, do not forget the back. Now, if we have determined that this patient has a severe uh, condition, we may decide we're going to quickly get this person loaded up and going, and if we log roll them up and we put them on the backboard and strap them down, we just lost the ability to do a good examination of their back. So it's, it's important that as we do some of these treatments that kind of are out of quote unquote order, uh, that we rem remember to do those appropriate assessments when uh, we have the opportunity. So real quickly for our quick scan, we're going to do in all areas look for DCAT-B, TLS, and other abnormal findings. And when we say other abnormal findings, we're based that off of wherever we're at. So if we're talking the ears, the nose, the mouth, do we have drainage? Is it clear? Is it bloody? Um, maybe when we're looking at uh, extremities. We're looking for the sensation, circulation, and motor function. We're checking the capillary refill. Um, we might be checking for odors on a patient's breath. Might be checking to see if the patient has lost control of their bowel or bladder. Communicate with your patient. Let them know what's going on. Even if you think they're completely unconscious, a lot of times they can hear what's going on. So be careful. I've had this uh, I've had patients come back and tell me, yeah, I was unconscious, but I could hear what was going on. So uh, expose the injured area before examining it. You cannot appropriately examine somebody with their downfield parka or their Carhartt coveralls on. You just can't get a good assessment of it. You're going to need to expose and examine. Remember what I said, you expose and examine the appropriate areas and then cover it back up. Assume spinal injury. If you have a major mechanism of injury, in most cases we believe, okay, there is probably a spinal injury involved. We're going to treat as if there is. 
and then stop or alter your assessment process to provide care as you go, with an exception, um, or a few exceptions, I should say. If we find that the patient has a, a broken forearm, yet they've been ejected from a car crash um, and have other more significant medical problems going on, we're not going to do the full standard treatment for a, a broken arm. We, we would like to splint it, but that's going to be based off of time and hands. So when we, uh, we might have to immobilize this patient on a long spine board, see collar, pad the voids, and so on and so forth. And then as we get time, we may come back and do a better job splinting that forearm. But a long spine board really is a full body splint. So our head and neck, in addition to the DCAT BTLS, we're going to look for cerebral spinal fluid in the ears and nose. Um, cerebral spinal fluid is clear. Um, so if you have a clear liquid draining from the ears or the nose, you need to be cautious. There's a couple things that uh, uh, we tend to uh, recommend people do uh, to check cerebral spinal fluid. Um, you can. The easiest thing you can do is take a 4x4 four four dressing basically kind of fold it into a cone so you've got the middle of the 4x4 four four at a point and the rest of it kind of drawn back, uh, almost like you're trying to throw it as a dart. Um, and then take that folded center, that tip of it that you've made, and stick that right into the liquid that's draining. And then you open that back up and look at it, and a lot of times you'll have clear center and then kind of a reddish-pinkish halo around that. Um, and that's actually remnants of, uh, uh, of blood, and that uh, is usually fairly positive for cerebral spinal fluid. The other thing you can do if you have a glucometer, uh, and this is kind of unconventional, but it, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty accurate to do this, um, is if you take some of that clear fluid and you um, put it on your glucometer, like you would check a patient's blood glucose, um, it will actually come back a fairly decent high, uh, sugar level because cerebral spinal fluid is water and sugar. Uh, that's what it is. So um, it, you'll get a, a blood sugar off of that. Unequal pupils. We talked about pupils uh, last uh, week, and uh, unequal pupils a lot of times is indicative of a uh, brain injury. Jugular venous distension, JVD. So these big two veins that run down the side of your neck. Basically, your, j your jugular veins go from straight down from about your earlobes. Uh, they go about straight down the sides of your neck from the earlobes, um, and they will bulge out if you have increased pressure within your chest. Uh, this is best checked when the patient is sitting at about a 45 degree angle, and those veins should not fill up more than halfway up your neck. Uh, if they're bulging out very easily and going all the way up to the top, then you have jugular venous distension. And like I said, a lot of times that means that there's excess pressure building up in the chest. And then consider the application of a C collar. Chest and abdomen. So in addition to our DCAP BTLS, we're going to look for paradoxical motion. Paradoxical motion is the chest uh, and in this case, we're talking about the chest. So the chest wall goes, um, part of that chest wall goes in the opposite direction that it should. So normally, if you will take a moment and look down at your own chest and inhale as largely as possible, you note that your chest wall goes up and outward. Well, in the case of a paradoxical motion, most of the chest goes upward and outward, but the area, and this is usually what we call a flail segment, because it's usually a couple of ribs next to each other broken, uh, that uh, is in paradoxical motion, actually will suck in and downward, uh, so it does exactly the opposite. When we exhale, what happens? Our chest wall typically falls. Well, in paradoxical motion, that segment or that chunk moves outward. So it's just the opposite of what we would normally expect. Uh, and like I said, normally this occurs when we have something called a flail segment, which is two or more consecutive ribs broken in two or more places. Crepitation. Uh, crepitus is a crunchy, crackly sound uh, or a crunchy, crackly feeling. Um, you can get two types of crepitus, bony crepitus and airy crepitus. 
bony crepitus is when you have bone ends grating together, and you kind of feel it cracking and crunching. Airy crepitus is something called subcutaneous emphysema. This is when air is leaked into the tissues, and it feels like almost, I hear people discuss it, or talk about it as a bubble wrap under the skin. I think there's a better way to describe it. The green foam that you get to put artificial flowers in, uh, they'll put silk flowers in for silk uh, flower arrangements. If you push your finger kind of into that green foam a little bit, it feels almost identical to uh, subcutaneous emphysema. So either of those are referred to as crepitus or crepitation. Are the breath sounds equal? And are they normal? Or are they off normal? And then is there any distension? Distension uh, typically occurs to the abdomen. And this is when a person uh, has an abdomen that looks like they're, you know, 20 months pregnant with an elephant. Um, they're, they're very, very uh, rounded and, and many times also firm to go along with that. So we're showing assessing the chest a little bit. Put your hands on their chest. Okay? You may not need to touch uh, the specific um, private parts, uh, the breasts, but um, you can touch around the breast area. You know, in men it's not going to be a big deal, in ladies it's probably going to be a little bit bigger of a deal. Um, but, and they're showing you that, the, the good thing about this picture here is they're showing you they're assessing the same parts on both sides, they're looking at it bilaterally um, and doing kind of a symmetry comparison here. Assessing the abdomen, you're going to palpate all four quadrants of the abdomen. Remember the belly button is the dividing line, upward and downward and across. You have the left upper, right upper, left lower and right lower. Um, the usual recommendation is if they have complaint in one specific part of their abdomen, that's the last area that you will palpate. So if their right lower quadrant is, is um, hurting them, you should probably start in the left upper quadrant, then do either the left lower or the right upper, uh, then the other one, and then you work your way then to the, um, uh, that last part, which would be the right lower. That's giving them heck. You're looking to feel if that anything's pulsing um, or if anything uh, elicits a pain response when you, when you touch it. So the pelvis and extremities. Um, in addition to BCAP BTLS, when we assess the pelvis, all we're going to do, you'll hear this and you'll see this, and this is a bad habit you can pick up from uh, old timers in the field of EMS, is they'll talk about stressing and rocking the pelvis. We do not stress and rock the pelvis anymore. We may put very, very gentle pressure on it, and it only takes a little bit of very gentle pressure. Um, just to kind of, if they have a broken pelvis, that little itty bitty amount of pressure will generally elicit a very big pain response and that's all we need. So we'll generally take our hands and just put them uh, on either side of the hips and squeeze in just very ever so slightly and then we might put them just very uh, lightly on the front sides of the hip bones and push just gently. Don't rock back and forth, it's just a very slight amount of pressure to determine whether or not uh, there's a potential break. One thing that we also look for in the male population is something called a priapism. And a priapism is an involuntary erection of the penis that will occur when uh, there are certain types of spinal cord injuries. It gets, uh, uh, the messages get crossed on where it should be and what it should be doing. And uh, they will get this involuntary uh, erection that often lasts for hours and hours. When you hear about the, uh, the Viagra commercial that talks about uh, if you have an erection lasting longer than four hours, uh, seek medical attention. Uh, that is actually a priapism as well. So assessing that distal circulation, sensation, and motor function, this is often abbreviated as the CSM, circulation, sensation, motor. You'll also hear it as the um, uh, PMS, which is um, pulse, motor and sensation. There's all kinds of different ways that people will refer to this. I don't really care which way you do. Um, just know what it stands for. Circulation, sensation, and motor. So when we're checking uh, you know, that right, I'm sorry, left upper picture there, 
Um, they're just kind of giving it the once over feel. Do you feel me touching your arm? So that would be sensation. Checking the circulation by checking the pulses. And then we might ask them, uh, make a fist, uh, squeeze my fingers, uh, put, and we'll put our hands on the bottoms of their feet, both hands on uh, both feet, and say, okay, now press down with your feet like you're pressing on the gas pedal. Flip your hands over to the top sides of their feet and say, okay, now pull your toes up towards your nose. Uh, and that's a way that we can do a, a um, comparison. So when we do, somebody has somebody maybe squeeze our, uh, squeeze our fingers, you put a couple fingers in their hand, say, okay, squeeze my fingers as hard as you can. Recommend that you do that on both sides at the same time. So your right foot, in the, or your right, I'm sorry, right fingers in their left hand and vice versa, say, now squeeze as hard as you can. Um, don't you do one side and your partner do the other side because you can't compare from side to side when you do that. Posterior to the back, this is they've log rolled this patient up. Uh, they've obviously got the C-collar in place. Somebody's still holding the C-spine. By the way, the person that's holding the head is in charge of the roll. So they're the one that makes the count and says, okay, we're going to do this. Um, so as they log rolled this patient up, obviously they've got him uh, partially undressed there. Depending on the condition, you maybe need to remove his pants as well. But you're going to run your hands down the back looking for all that DCAT VTLS. So what criteria could you use to decide whether to form, perform a focused exam or a rapid trauma exam? Well, this is obviously from the, the all the scene clues you get and as well as the patient's response. They tell you, it's only my ankle, I have no other complaints, nothing else was hurt, and they describe the situation and it sounds like, yeah, it really should just be an isolated injury. That's what helps guide this. If you have an unconscious patient, you have a patient with injuries to multiple areas of their body and they're not reliable source of information, then you have to do the, you know, the unstable rapid trauma assessment. Pediatric notes, uh, lesser mechanisms can cause significant damage. Obviously, uh, if you remember when we talked about the heights of falls, we talked about three times a person's height, really. Well, in, in kids, that could be you know, six, eight, ten feet. But in an adult, we're generally talking 15 to 20. So, um, And then we need to thoroughly explain those assessments more thoroughly to this population. They don't understand what we're doing. They know a stranger is over in their face touching them. So we have to try to win their trust, involve their caregivers when we can, um, and then just tell them what we're doing. And there's your video, a detailed physical exam. So a detailed physical exam would be done after we've done our um, either focused exam or our uh, rapid trauma exam. Uh, we, detailed physical exams get done when we have the time and the hands to do it. But we don't always have the time and the hands to do the detail. But it's typically completed on the way to the hospital. This just helps us gather more information. This is basically taking that head to toe uh, assessment or head-to-toe exam and going much more detailed in that. Um, looking, going inch by inch really as opposed to kind of looking at the, the body part as, as kind of a, a unit. Uh, this complements our primary and our secondary assessment uh, and it's performed after all critical interventions um, are completed. So after we've done everything that we need to to make sure that this patient is as stable as we can make them. Um, then we can start to thinking about doing this. But we're not going to jump and go down the road of the detailed physical exam and we need to be doing chest compressions or putting oxygen on a patient. Uh, it's not appropriate. The patient's not ready for, for a detailed exam. The primary assessment is reevaluated again before we initiate this. More, this helps us uh, continuously go back and reevaluate those things that may kill you. So to perform this, we're going to expose the patient as much as possible or as much as necessary. We're going to work around any immobilization equipment that we've already placed. We're not going to take things off just to do this detailed assessment or detailed physical exam. Uh, the components are very similar, like I said, to the rapid trauma exam, just more detailed. Is it necessary 
should always complete a detailed assessment on a trauma patient with no significant mechanism of injury. No, it is not. We oftentimes don't have the time to do it anyway. If you are in a small town of you know 2,000 people and you have a hospital in town, um, chances are probably pretty good. Most of your calls you go on, you're, you'll be at the hospital before you even get done with the secondary exam. So in those cases, you never even get to it. So comparing these assessments, responsive child, no significant mechanism of injury, we focus on the chief complaint, get the physical exam, baseline vital signs, a history, and obviously sometimes we need to involve family, uh, and then a detailed physical exam and further care as needed. An unresponsive adult significant mechanism of injury, we have the history of the present illness, and that can be difficult to get if we have a, an unwitnessed event, uh, manual stabilization of the head and neck, and ALS requests, so you want to get ALS coming, um, rapid trauma assessment, that real quick once over head to toe, baseline vital signs, get a past medical history or as much of it as you possibly can, and again, that's going to be based off of the clues we find or family members, and then a detailed physical exam as time allows. So our chapter review, uh, the patient without significant mechanism of injury receives a history of the present illness and a physical exam focused on the areas of the patient's complaints. Gather a set of vital signs, baseline vital signs, any past medical history. All patients may need to try to get those on. So for patients with significant mechanism of injury, um, ensure that continued manual stabilization of the head or neck. Contain, uh, consider whether you need ALS. Get a brief history of the present illness and then perform your rapid trauma exam. Look for wounds, tenderness, deformities, plus additional signs appropriate to the part being assessed. Systematically examine, obviously, the head, neck, chest, abdomen, pelvis, extremities, posterior of the body, and after assessing the neck, apply the C-collar. Um, whichever way you choose to tackle, if you want to do uh, head, neck, chest, abdomen, pelvis, arms, then legs, then back, or maybe you want to do head, neck, chest, abdomen, pelvis, back, legs, arms, whatever, uh, whichever way you determine that works best for you, try to develop your system and try to keep using the same system constantly. If you practice it that way, it, you're much less likely to forget something. After completing the physical assessment, immobilize the patient with the spine board and get the baseline set of vitals and their PMH. And then after performing appropriate critical interventions and transport has begun, you may do a phys detailed physical exam on the way. Detailed physical exam, very similar to the rapid trauma assessment, but there is time to be more thorough. And the detailed physical exam does not take place before transport unless the, pay the transport is delayed. So maybe uh, we've had a technical difficulty or a patient is, is, we're trapped somewhere that we can't get the patient moved right away. That would be the only time that we, we would go um, and, and do this on scene. The detailed physical exam is most appropriate for the trauma patient who is unresponsive or has a significant mechanism of injury or an unknown mechanism of injury. And it is most appropriate for them because we can't get a lot of info from them. When the patient can give us feedback, they're much less likely that we're going to need a detailed physical exam. Remember, use the mechanism of injury to determine the need for rapid trauma assessment. Assume the spinal injury until, um, until you're told otherwise, and then work as a team to complete the assessment. Somebody can be getting vital signs. Somebody can be doing the hands-on. Somebody can be gathering a history. Um, if you can, can work out a system, great. So some questions. How the focus, history, and physical exam of the trauma patient with a significant mechanism of injury differ from those of the trauma patient with no significant mechanism of injury? 
lists the steps and areas covered in the rapid trauma assessment. And how are these steps different in the detailed assessment? So critical thinking, you're assessing a patient who fell three stories. He is unresponsive and bleeding into his airway. The driver of the ambulance is positioning the vehicle and bringing equipment to you. How do you balance the patient's need for airway control? Um, they comment that he requires frequent sectioning. And the need to assess his injuries. Well, in this case, this might be a situation in which you get minimal secondary assessment on this patient because you're constantly involved with dealing with this primary assessment. If you're constantly sectioning the airway, you cannot neglect the airway uh, and spend five minutes doing uh, a very drawn out extensive secondary assessment. You're going to have to constantly be rechecking, relooking, and rethinking is this what uh, th this patient needs.